welcome everyone to another edition of From the Woods Today. I'm Renee Williams and I'm here with my co-host Billy Thomas. We both work in the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources and we are so glad to have you with us today. Oh, no doubt, Renee. This is such an exciting show. We're going to be talking about butterflies and monarchs and the tree of the week. And we're going to be giving folks an update on the Woodland Owners Short Course. You know, it is so much fun to do this show and connect with people that are interested in woodlands and wildlife, not only here in Kentucky, but around the world. So um, we really appreciate having you all with us today. Um, a big shout out to our Zoom uh, attendees that are attending live with us, as well as to our Facebook Live viewers out there. We're really glad to have you all as part of this show. Um, it, Renee, just a general reminder for our audience that we do record these segments and they are available on our website from the woods today.com so if you've never missed any shows you can go back and check them out there definitely and remember too if you have a question anytime during the show um, we have a chat pod you just put the, put your question in the chat pod and we will get um, the presenter to give that information um, also if you're on Facebook live please like and share us do a watch party if you'd like to um, we you know the more people that know about our show the better off uh, we think everyone could be um, to, to, just to learn about the topics that we have. Um, you can also put questions in um, the chat information on the Facebook page and we'll try to get back to you as well on that. So yeah. I guess without further ado, we can keep, we can start today's show. Yeah, you know, and I'd like to pull Laurie up real quick if we could. Um, Laurie's actually responsible for bringing us our first guest today. Um, Laurie has a chance to lead the uh, Ohio River Valley Woodland and Wildlife Workshop program that we partner with Ohio State and Purdue. Um, she leads that for us here in Kentucky. And uh, yep. Laurie, you, you, you came across somebody that could be um, have some great content that we want to share with folks. Yeah, we sure did. And actually, we, we learned about um, Dr. Adam Baker from our uh, our, our co our our people in our people we work with in Ohio and um, they had had Adam come do several talks for them on monarchs and monarch way stations in the past and he came highly recommended I'm like wow he's right here at UK so this is <laughs> awesome we're really glad to have Adam with us today and um, just a little bit about um, Dr. Baker um, he graduated from the entomology department at the University of Kentucky in 2020 he said he just finished his PhD in May so congratulations um, he studied okay butterfly ecology and conservation. He hails from southwest Michigan where he spent his youth exploring the dunes, bogs, and woods of the lower peninsula. Pretty amazing and now you're down here in Kentucky. His work on monarch butterfly conservation in the urban landscape has been featured in symposia, articles, and educator trainings nationwide. So we're super excited to have Adam with us today and I'm really looking forward to um, to learning all about Monarch Way Stations and how they're beneficial, butterfly gardens and how they're beneficial to our unfortunately declining populations of monarch butterflies. So thank you for coming today, Adam, and we look forward to hearing your talk. All right, so Adam, if you wanna bring your video and that microphone up, and we'll introduce you to our From the Woods Today audience. Um, we're certainly glad to have you with us today. Um, hey, Adam, how are you? I'm good, how are you today? Doing well. Thank you so much for being with us. Um, yeah, looking forward to it. All right. Well, thanks for joining me today. I'm just going to give you a, a quick uh, tips and tricks uh, to help improve your monarch butterfly garden in your own backyard or property. Um, anybody that's been involved with monarch conservation know that that this is a big movement going on, and there's not a whole lot of information on uh, looking at gardens uh, from the small garden perspective. There's a lot of work going on in the uh, larger breeding grounds in the agriculturally dominated uh, Midwest states, uh, but little is being done uh, looking at the, uh, the monarch butterfly garden. Uh, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the monarch butterfly um, with its spectacular annual migration as well as its relationship with its, its host plant, the milkweed, the only plant that it can use to raise its young. Um, so I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on that today, and I'm gonna spend a little more time just on the monarch gardens. But what I will say, it's been pretty amazing to me working with this insect for the past five years, um, is our interest in this insect. Uh, its spectacular migration story inspires an interest in nature. Uh, it's the official state insect of several U.S. states, and it's celebrated in, uh, in festivals all across North America. It informs our scientific literacy. It's one of the first 
lessons of metamorphosis and, and the life cycle, as well as this host plant specificity in our elementary classrooms. And that education continues uh, as we get older. Here's a really cool example uh, of a installment at Interpretive Signage at the North Carolina Arboretum, where they have this giant five foot tall Lego monarch uh, accompanied uh, with this story of its life cycle. And also these monarchs are great for our green industry businesses. Uh, just in the time that I've spent here uh, over the last few years in Lexington, it's been amazing to see the transformation of the types of plants available uh, at our different horticultural centers. So with that, let's talk a little bit about the research that we've done here in Kentucky. So one thing that we've noticed is that if you wanna have a productive monarch waste station is that you want to have your plants easily accessible and apparent as possible. Here we see on the left a plant that has a that's isolated it has a very strong visual silhouette uh, which is most likely what monarchs are using to initially find their host plants. Uh, so when it your plants are isolated it's got that strong silhouette it's very accessible from head to toe as well as apparent. Whereas if you have milkweeds in uh, vegetation and competition situations that the uh, plants are harder to find because they lose that silhouette and also they can be less accessible. Uh, we ran an experiment looking just uh, exactly at this at the uh, Lexington Arboretum where we compared isolated plants with plants that were surrounded by ornamental grasses and what we found was that the isolated plants were colonized much more readily than plants that were accompanied in competition. We also looked at the design of gardens. Uh, sorry, my dog is uh, growling at the mailman. So we want to look at also at the design of gardens. Uh, we initially did a survey of, of 22 pre-existing Monarch Way stations in Central Kentucky, all of them unique to the person that installed them. And we wanted to see if we can take uh, some of the, the positive notes from that observational study and apply them to our own gardens. Uh, so in this study, we created three different gardens uh, with the same botanical composition, uh, but in three different designs. In our first design, we put all of our milkweed on the perimeter of the garden. Uh, we isolated those plants, had them uh, stand out with mulch and then put all of our nectar plants in the middle. In our second design we did the exact opposite where we essentially created a wall of flowers around our milkweeds in the center of the garden which creates a visual and chemical obstruction. And then in our third design we had all of the plants intermixed and competing for the same space. And what we found in this study was pretty striking. Uh, in both years that we that we tracked colonization in the gardens we found that milkweeds with uh, or the gardens with the perimeter milkweeds had a lot more monarchs in both years. In the first year there's about 2.5 more time uh, monarchs in our gardens than our interior or mixed designs. In 2018 we had about a fourfold increase of monarchs compared to our other two gardens uh, which uh, behaved rather similarly. We also get a lot of questions about what types of milkweeds we should be using in our gardens. And to dig deeper in this, we, we did a study where we looked at eight different species of milkweeds that are readily available uh, online uh, and through the markets. They uh, present a vast array of different flower colors and forms, um, different architectures, plant heights, uh, broad leaf, narrow leaves, a pretty diverse group even with, within just the genus. What we found was pretty interesting. Uh, in our first year of tracking all of these different milkweeds, we found that the three relatively uh, tall and broadleaf milkweeds were the most attractive to monarchs. Um, in the first year, the incarnata or swamp milkweed, uh, the speciosa or the showy milkweed, and the syriaca or the common milkweed were all the most attractive for getting monarchs into your garden. Uh, in the first year, they all maxed out at about the same height, and in that year, the swamp milkweed was the most attractive. In the second year, however, uh, the swamp milkweed maxed out at about the same height, whereas the other two species grew about two and a half feet taller. And so the preferences change in the second year. Now the showy was the most attractive, followed by the common and the swamp milkweeds. 
So this is further evidence that there's some sort of uh, visual attraction to the host plants happening uh, in the discovery rate of our monarch host plants. Uh, we did find uh, by rearing out caterpillars on all of the different types of milkweed that there was no difference in larval growth and development. They all seem to be so uh, suitable uh, for raising caterpillars, although some plants get very few eggs or colonized by very few caterpillars. And we did find some difference in behaviors of the milkweeds. Uh, some milkweeds are going to uh, be well behaved and stay put and only spread via seed. Uh, these are great for small gardens. Uh, we love the combination of the butterfly and swamp milkweed uh, because they're highly attractive to monarchs as well as bees. Uh, and then if you want something that's going to be uh, filling in a large area and uh, something that's going to be a little more aggressive, the common milkweed is a great choice here in Kentucky. Uh, but of course, milkweeds aren't just for monarchs. There's also a whole suite of other special insects that use the foliage, but also uh, bees that use the blooms. Um, if you'd like to help support large aphid bees like the, like the honeybees, carpenter bees, or bumblebees, uh, common milkweed, the showy milkweed, and the swamp milkweed, all with relatively larger flower forms, are going to be great for these uh, types of bees. If you're more interested in smaller native bees like sweat bees and, and mason bees and leaf cutter bees, uh, the butterfly milkweed was actually the most attractive milkweed as far as the numbers of bees were concerned. And the world milkweed actually attracted the greatest diversity of bees out of all of the milkweeds we looked at. Lastly, I'm just gonna touch on this idea of cultivars and native cultivars within the garden. Uh, I'd like to preface this by saying I would not recommend using cultivated varieties of plants in natural areas, but in the backyard, I think they can be just fine. And the question is here, uh, here is whether or not these cultivars offer the same ecological value and function uh, in our gardens as do their ancestral native wild types. So in this study, we looked at two different species of milkweed. Up on top, we have the swamp milkweed and three of its cultivars, the soulmate, which is selecting for larger floral displays, the ice ballet, which has a white flower, as well as a lighter color foliage, and the Cinderella, which has larger flower clusters. On the bottom, we have the, the tuberosa group or the butterfly milkweed group. Um, all three of these are selecting for uh, different flower colors and expressions, the hello yellow, bright yellow, the gay butterflies expressing three different plume colors, and the blonde bombshell. Uh, another yellow variety. And what we found was that uh, we didn't find any differences at all when it came to colonization. Uh, monarch butterflies do not perceive cultivars of their native wild types any differently. They're all colonized readily. Uh, we did not find any differences in the uh, overall growth and development of caterpillars. And we did not see any differences uh, or, or slight differences in defensive characteristics, although they weren't severe enough to influence growth and development of caterpillars. But we did find some differences when it came to the bees. So here we had the swamp milkweed group uh, with all of the uh, bees broken down by family on the top row and broken down by genus on, this, on the bottom row. You can see from the top row, they all look relatively similar, uh, but when we look a little bit closer at the genus level, you can see that soulmate stands out quite a bit. Uh, and remember, that's the one that's choosing for a larger floral display. Uh, so with this larger floral display, it's attracting a, a much greater diversity of bees. And in our butterfly milkweed group, once so again, if you look at the top row, the one that stands out is the blonde bombshell, uh, which is almost completely dominated by those uh, helicted bees. And that's expressed once again in the bottom row uh, where almost all of those bees are from one genus. Uh, now just take a quick look at the bottom row. Uh, you don't need to decipher this fully, but just look at the, the numbers of colors represented and the diversity of the bees on them and then compare that to our last slide with the swamp milkweed group. As you can see, the, the butterfly milkweed is way more diverse when it comes to bee attraction than, and than the swamp milkweed group is. Here's just a look at what some of our bee collections look like. Now these are both from 
butterfly milkweed cultivars that both have yellow flowers, but they can express completely different bee communities. Uh, on the left, we have a collection from the Blonde Bombshell cultivar. As you can see, they're almost exclusively small, uh, usually the metallic green uh, sweat bees. And on the right, you can see a collection from the Hello Yellow, which is a lot more diversity, more of the leaf gutter bees and the bumblebees associated with that. So just a quick summary of what you can do to help improve your monarch garden is to plant gardens in open areas uh, whenever possible. Uh, make sure you have open lines of sight, especially to the north and south. Uh, use plant spacing within your gardens. Uh, isolating those plants can increase colonization. Uh, they don't all have to be isolated. You can use a combination of isolated plants as well as plants in clusters. Uh, plant milkweeds uh, towards the exterior of the garden or make them apparent and accessible as possible. Uh, we do want the monarchs to find them as easily as possible, so we don't want to hide them behind stuff or make very complicated uh, plant uh, competition scenarios. Use a combination of milkweed species to, to meet your, your conservation and your aesthetic goals. Um, use ones that are going to be highly attractive to monarchs. Use ones that are going to be highly attractive to bees. Uh, also, generally, the, the ones that are less attractive to monarchs can be secondary host plants as caterpillars can move off of the uh, crowded or deteriorating uh, milkweeds that they prefer onto other milkweeds, which are also suitable host plants. Uh, and use those combination of species to, to get your conservation goals. Also including your gardens, uh, early and late blooming nectar plants. That's really uh, one of the areas that, that we don't have a lot of nectar and that's when the monarchs are gonna be migrating. So it's gonna be important to have those in your garden. And then in your own gardens or urban areas, you can use cultivars to add visual interest and they can also provide ecological function within your garden. Um, so don't be afraid to, to spice up your designs with some of those. Of course, I'd like to thank uh, everybody that helped make all this research possible. I'll be happy to take any questions that you all have. Thanks for joining me today. Well, thank you so much. We greatly appreciate you uh, giving us this presentation. And one thing I wanted to know is um, if you wanted to create a, a butterfly garden, what kind of space do you actually, should you have as a just a regular homeowner? Uh, well, we found that you can, uh, gardens can be very small. You don't need a whole lot of space. You can have, uh, you know, hundreds, 100 square meters or 100 square feet and have a productive garden. Uh, what's more important is how you present your milkweed uh, to the monarchs. Like I said, make sure you, you have open lines of sight whenever possible. You got to work with the property that you have, of course, and then make sure that you're at least incorporating some isolated plants uh, within that garden design. Uh, I've seen gardens with four milkweed plants with 30 caterpillars crawling all over them, so that can happen. Okay, and again, um, if you have questions, please type them in the chat pod so we can get them to him. But uh, we do have a couple questions already and people wanna know what can they do with their lawns to help pollinators? Uh, well, of course, there's a lot of uh, work that's been going into this. Um, if you have a lot of clover in your lawn, uh, you can always help to mow around that. Uh, bees love clover as well as other pollinators. Um, so whenever it's in full bloom, just try not to mow. Uh, or if you, if you do have to treat your lawn with something, make sure that you mow directly afterwards to make sure that the bees aren't being exposed to any of those chemicals that can be picked up and uh, allocated to the nectar. Okay. But my suggestion is what we do with, with here uh, with my wife uh, in our garden is we don't really have any lawn left. <laughs> it just slowly keeps getting reduced <laughs> to more and more plants. Uh, we have paths. <laughs> <laughs> and do all these have to be in a, uh, a sunny area or can they be in a shaded like a, under a tree or something like that? Uh, certainly there's a, about a hundred species in, in uh, North America that you can use as far as milkweeds concerned. Um, so each of them are going to have their own uh, different types of habitats. Some are more suited to shade. Uh, all of the ones that I mentioned today are going to be able to, to handle full sun. And I think you'll probably have, uh, you'll probably see more monarchs in open sun areas rather than having them under shade, but you can certainly use a combination of both. Okay. And someone also was asked if you could suggest a good or easy resource to help design a butterfly garden. Uh, well, those resources aren't really available, um, which is why I've done some of this work. 
Mm -hmm. um, if you look on the official Monarch Way Station page, uh, what they say is um, plant milkweeds two times, two types, plant nectar plants and have plants close together. That's their entire recommendation page. Um, so this is, uh, this is some of the first work that looks at this as far as garden design is concerned. And I'm not aware of any websites that help you design your garden. Um, but try to think about it from the ecological standpoint. Uh, design a garden that's meant for butterflies. Don't design a garden that's meant for humans. If your goal is to support biodiversity and to support butterflies, try not to design it in a way that's going to, to uh, go against that. Uh, you know, one thing that we saw is uh, when people put their gardens in courtyards with high walls, where the only way that a butterfly can encounter it is from a bird's eye view. Uh, we did uh, monitor one garden just like that. And throughout the season, we found zero monarchs in that garden. Oh, oh okay. All right. I was going to say, Adam, you did such a good job of highlighting the importance of the monarchs as far as like being a, um, I, I don't know, like a keystone species as far as like people's attention, um, you know, to get people excited about pollinators and, and get youth involved in nature and stuff. I, I was really impressed with that. Um, one thing I did want to mention, I do know that the Natural Resources Conservation Service, which is a agency of the United States Department of Agriculture, does um, have some programs available for like landowners as well for pollinator habitat. So if you're a landowner out there and you have more than just a yard, there are also some programs that will help you um, put in some pollinator habitat, which would help monarchs and our bees and many other things. So um, if that's something of interest to you, you know, you can check with your local NRCS office and they can give you some details on that. But um, Adam, I really appreciate you kind of highlighting um, this majestic species um, and how we can go about helping not only it, but really all the other pollinators that are really in peril. So, um, yeah, good stuff. Renee, yeah. I thought there was a, another question. Or there two are or a couple more that have come in, actually. And um, so one uh, a gentleman, Raymond Cox, wants to know that he plans to plant milkweed on the exterior of his garden next year. And is there any special kind he should plant? Well, that kind of depends on what your your goals are, both aesthetically as well as you know for your conservation. Um, I really like the swamp milkweed. That's that's my favorite milkweed for for the monarchs. Um, it's going to stay put. Uh, it's got a very nice architecture. It gets about you know three and a half foot tall. Uh, it's got a nice floral display. Um, but certainly, if you're not if you're not worried about it escaping into other parts of your garden, the common milkweed is a very tall and uh, brutish milkweed that'll, that'll serve that purpose as well. Okay. We also have a question about um, when monarchs are going to be in the southern part of Ohio. So I don't, do you know that answer? Uh, they should be there now. Um, they're certainly okay. here in Kentucky and we're not that far away. Um, people are seeing uh, fewer numbers of butterflies this year and that could be for a, numbers, a number of reasons, but uh, stay vigilant, visit some of your uh, nature sanctuaries, especially the ones that have uh, large uh, prairie, uh, prairie type areas. There's a great one here in Lexington called Heisel Farm Park. If you haven't seen a monarch this year, go there and guarantee you'll find one pretty quickly. And uh, oh, sorry, go, oh, ahead. go ahead. I was gonna say there's one more question. Um, any major predators are of monarch caterpillars or diseases? Uh, certainly. Uh, we just published a paper uh, just on this subject. You can find it uh, uh, from in scientific reports. Um, it's looking at the relationship between an invasive wasp and uh, monarch butterflies. Mm -hmm. Now, this is going to be more of an, a, a problem in the urban environment or in areas that are close to wooden or man-made structures. Uh, the European paper wasp uh, predominantly makes its nest in man-made structures and it is a caterpillar hunting specialist. So I'd be on the lookout for this one. Uh, essentially uh, creating gardens in urban areas where this wasp is prevalent is most likely creating ecological traps for gardens or for, for monarchs. Uh, in our study, we find we found uh, a lot, a lot of predation of, of monarchs by this wasp. Uh, they have these really cool behaviors that they've picked up where the, when they actually encounter a caterpillar, they'll actually remove the digestive tract of the caterpillar leave it there on the leaf so they can avoid those chemical toxins from, from the plant wow. and be able to feed on the caterpillar. Uh, also avoid things like butterfly boxes, birdhouses, or any other wooden structures that are gonna be prime nesting spots for these wasps near your gardens. And you may want to treat uh, some of these wasps in your landscape, especially these invasive ones. 
it, you know, Adam, that's a really important point I think you just brought up because it seems like I was seeing a proliferation of butterfly boxes, you know, popping up. So I'm, I guess I'm hearing from you that maybe they're not the, as good as we thought they might have been as far as helping our monarch. Uh, yeah, they, there's no evidence whatsoever that they help butterflies. Um, if you want to see some uh, pretty uh, alarming pictures, check out that publication. Uh, we looked at 16 different butterfly boxes on the UK campus, all within pollinator gardens, and 13 of them all had wasp nests in, in them with absolutely no nev evidence that a butterfly has ever used them. So they're essentially... Wow. It's a you know road paved with good wasp. intentions, but they're essentially creating a you know habitat for a wasp hunting specialists within the garden. <laughs> hey, well, we've learned something really good from your research at a minimum, <laughs> right there. Uh, you know, um, might help a lot of folks and help a lot of monarchs too. Well, I tried to stick to the more positive stories. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Someone asked too. Um, can you tag mo uh, monarchs? You certainly can tag monarchs. Uh, you can go through the, the Monarch Watch website and get tags that way. Uh, just make sure that you're tagging monarchs that are actually migrating. Uh, so you don't want to be tagging during June or July. You want to be tagging later uh, in the season when they're likely to be migrating. And generally those migrating butterflies are going to be a lot bigger and stronger and healthier because uh, they're not worried about finding dates. They're worried about flying south. Okay. Very interesting information yeah, you provided. No Thank doubt. you so much. We greatly yeah. appreciate it. No problem. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. No, Dr. Baker, thank you very much. Um, and congratulations on completing your research and um, good luck to you in the future. And um, hopefully there'll be people reaching out to you soon to offer you a job to help our pollinators and monarchs across the nation. Thank you very much. You'll have a great day. All right. Thank you, sir. All right, Billy, moving on. So. Um, we have a topic that you're going to actually present to us today. Yes, I want to talk a little bit just for a few moments about the Woodland Owner Short Course. So if you all know us at the UK Department of Forestry and Natural Resources, um, we have been coordinating the Kentucky Woodland Owner Short Course for going on 15 years now. And that's a program that we typically had at county extension offices where we then uh, meet there and we do some in-person programming. And then we go out to a, an adjacent woodland owner nearby and visit their property and look at some of the practices that they've done on there. And we have interactions with a lot of the organizations and partners that are available to help woodland owners here in Kentucky. Unfortunately, <laughs> we're not able to do what we normally do with that program. So we've come up with a hybrid approach and I just wanted to kind of unveil it to the, our audience today and let them know um, what we're thinking about doing and how we're gonna go about it and encourage them to consider registering for that. And um, we don't have the registration uh, a, a page available just yet, but it will be hopefully within the next week or so. But I did wanna real briefly just kind of go over what we're planning, Renee. Sure. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and share that with, with our group here. So this is the, the um, 2020 Kentucky Wilden Honor Short Course we're going to be talking about. And like I mentioned, we have to do a new format. Um, COVID has kind of tied our hands as far as what we can do um, as far as an educational programming. So what we're going to try to do is we are going to basically have it open and it's designed for woodland owners, but really anybody that has an interest in woodlands and wildlife here in Kentucky or really across the nation um, is welcome to joining us on this. So even if you're not a woodland owner, we feel like you could get a lot of good information and content out of it. We are not going to be holding a registration fee, so there will be no charge to participate in the 2020 Kentucky Woodland Owner Short Course. However, registration will be required. So we will ask that you register. Basically, we're just looking for your name and an email address um, so that we can communicate with you about the program. So registration will be required. And it's gonna consist of some live Zoom webinars, not too dissimilar from what we're doing here, but really with a much more major focus on specific woodland and wildlife management practices. And then we'll work with the Kentucky State, um, the, the Kentucky Division of Forestry to offer some tours of state forests here in the state. So um, real quick, you know, so starting on August 18th is when our green track is going. And that's really designed for folks that are just now um, getting started managing their woodlands, or maybe they just acquired 
yards and woodlands and they're looking about trying to get active. So we have um, four sessions um, targeted specifically for that group. And then we have some for folks that are a little more engaged. This would be for landowners that maybe already have a management plan for the property and maybe they've been working with some professionals but they're looking to ramp up their involvement on the property. Um, so those are going to be started on August 20th. And then we're going to have, and a date to be determined sometime in September, um, we're going to have an evening session with many of the partner organizations that are available to help with the owners. So this is a chance for landowners across the state to interact with some of these partners and ask questions about how they can work with them. Prior to that, we're going to have some segments of each of these partners video um, recorded that you all can watch um, so that you've got some orientation to these groups. So that's kind of the, the Zoom part of the Kentucky Woodland Owner Short Course 2020. And then the uh, next part of it is really working with the Kentucky Division of Forestry to offer tours at their state forest. The Kentucky Division of Forestry uh, manages a number of state forests across the state and we have um, partnered with them and they're going to be highlighting five of those state forests. So the, there's going to be forests in western Kentucky, central Kentucky, and eastern Kentucky. And we're still working out the details a little bit on this, but we do know the two dates. On September 19th and September 26th, there will be state forests that will be open and available for registered people um, that have a registered for the Woodland Owner Short Course. And that registration is important so we can kind of get a handle on how many people are going to be there. That we will have to follow any social distancing or mask requirements that are going on at that time, um, but we do need to have a handle on who's going to be there. So it will only that information will only be communicated to those who register. So that's kind of the plan for the short course um, for this year. We will be opening that registration real soon, and we hope that you all will be able to join us. Um, even if you're not able to hit some of those live sessions, uh, the way we're setting it up, Renee, is that we're going to be recording those sessions. So as long as you've um, registered for the short course, you will be able to have access to those recordings as well. So um, even if those dates don't work live for you, you will be able to participate on the recordings. And the other thing that's kind of neat about this year, Renee, so sometimes in the past people are like, I want to go to the green track and the gold track. Right, well, I, hear kind that of a lot. <laughs> I know. So we've kind of addressed that with this. So you will be able to go to both the green and the gold track. Now, certainly, you know, we've kind of thinking of a certain audience um, with each of those different tracks, but they're going to be open to whoever registers for the Woodland Owner Short Course. So um, please look out um, for more information coming very soon on that. Just working on a few final details as far as some of the dates with our partners, as well as the Kentucky Division of Forestry on the state forest. But we should know that information relatively soon. And um, I'll encourage you all to register and participate. Um, it's going to be some ways like from the woods today, but we hope a, a little bit more um, uh, intensive as far as woodland and wildlife management practices and what you can actually do uh, on your property. So um, I just wanted to announce that to the, our audience um, and, and encourage them to help us spread the word um, when we get that the details out. So Renee, that's what I want to talk about. You got any thoughts or yeah. I mean, you've been a part of it forever too. So. <laughs> Yeah, since 2006, so it's been a long yeah. time. Um, but uh, yeah, again, if anybody has any questions, make sure to type them in the chat pod. I don't want people to forget about that. But Billy, I just wanted you to touch a little bit about, I mean, normally when, if, when and if people have come to the Woodland Owner Short Course, they're outside, they're doing some internal uh, in, inside sessions and then some outside sessions and we go outside and tell them. But this year with COVID, we just can't do that. Hopefully, maybe later on, we can have a social distancing event in person at the State Forest. But so this year's format is totally different than what people are used to, right? It, it really is. So, and I know it can maybe be a little confusing for some of our folks who have been um, traditional attendees to our Woodland Owner Short Course. Um, but, you know, we, we kind of waited, Renee, to be honest, as long as we could. Um, we were hopeful that we'd still be able to hold in-person uh, meetings, um, you know, the summer like we normally do. But it's it's just not shaping up to look that way. So um, we finally had to kind of make a, a decision to move on in this direction. But so we still want to provide good educational information to landowners here in Kentucky, but really benefit landowners really across the United States. Um, but we also want to make sure that we get these partner organizations in front of these woodland owners. You know, one of the things, Renee, I really love about the Kentucky Woodland Owner Short Course is it connects these landowners that are really trying to do good things on their property with the professionals that can help 
help them, that they can come out to their property, meet with them, talk about what they're trying to achieve on their property. And many times, a lot of these groups have programs that can help you do those practices. And that could be in the form of technical assistance or even financial support to help you implement some of these practices. So we're hoping the partner webinar will achieve that. And we really wanted to have that kind of field component still. So the Kentucky Division of Forestry has, manages their forests in a very sustainable manner. So we want to try to highlight some of the great work that they're doing um, to maybe inspire and show other landowners what they could actually do on their property as well. So it's going to be different, um, but our mission is still the same, really to educate Kentucky's woodland owners on what they can do with their woodlands and who can help them really get the most out of those woodlands to make them as healthy and productive as they can be. Right, and a lot of the same people that you would be seeing in person will also be the ones doing the webinars. So um, it's not like they're you're not getting it. You're not getting that field component, but you know, hope maybe yeah. next year we can we can do that again. But the one good thing, like you did say earlier, is I get a lot of people that go, "Oh, I want to attend this class in the green track, but I really want to attend that class in the gold track." And when we meet in person, they have to decide which one they actually want to attend yeah. this way they can do them all. And so no that's doubt. one good thing of it. They can actually, yeah. you know, get that tree ID if they wanted to be in the gold class, but they could still do the tree ID. So there are a few yeah. benefits to it as well. Yeah. So hopefully, you know, we're going to make the most of it. You know, I've been working really closely with all of our presenters and, uh, you know, they're getting their programs ready for us and working closely with the partners in the state for us. So I'm really excited about it. You know, it's a way for us to really try to help support um, woodlands here in Kentucky and make sure that they're being well taken care of. So. Right, looking definitely. To it. Well, thank you for that, Billy. We greatly appreciate yeah. Yeah. all that information. And anyone who's attended the short course, I think we'll, we'll, we'll enjoy this year, even though it's a little different, they'll enjoy this it year is. as well. Yeah, no doubt. Moving on to our famous tree of the week, we have uh, Lori Thomas coming back on, if she can get on and uh, tell us a little bit about what tree she's talking about this week. Right. Thanks, Renee. I'm not sure about famous, but um, I do enjoy doing this. So. You've done every single show, so I'm calling you famous. <laughs> um, again, it's an enjoyable to do. But this week, I we're, we're um, I'm talking about a, a group of well, one tree, but in a group that I haven't talked about um, in the past. I'm going to talk about red maple. So we have numerous maples native to Kentucky, and so we're I'm focusing on red maple. Last week, you got to here with um, Dr. Ellen Crocker's uh, talk when she was talking about poison ivy, how we have one maple that can be confused sometimes with poison ivy and that's box elder. It actually has a compound leaf. But this week is red maple. This is an outstanding landscape tree. It's, it's, got, it's wonderful in all seasons. It looks beautiful in spring. It looks great in the summer and just absolutely gorgeous in the fall. And pretty easy establishment. Um, not very long lived, but grows pretty quick. So I hope you enjoy learning a little bit about um, red maple and I'll, anywhere you live in the state, you can encounter red maple. It grows all across the state. So here is red maple this week. Great. Hi there. I'm Laurie Thomas with the University of Kentucky Forestry and Natural Resources Extension. And I'm here with the tree of the week, the red maple. Red maple. Acer rubrum is the most common individual tree species in Kentucky. It is also known as scarlet maple, swamp maple, and soft maple. This tree can thrive on a wider range of soil types, textures, moisture, pH, and elevation than any other forest species in North America. It is a fast-growing, short to medium-lived tree that seldom lives longer than 150 years. Red maple typically reaches maturity in 70 to 80 years. It is a medium-sized tree that grows 60 to 90 feet in height and up to 30 inches in diameter. It is considered shade tolerant in the northern part of its range, but shade intolerant in the Piedmont. Red maple is one of the most widely distributed trees in eastern North America. It is a common tree throughout the entire eastern United States into the central part of the country. Red maple is important and numerous in many forest stands today, where it was found in limited numbers in the past. This increase is thought to be due to a combination of in an increase in disturbances such as disease and insects and forest harvesting, as well as fire suppression. Many foresters consider the tree inferior and undesirable because it is often poorly formed and defective, especially on poor sites. On good sites, however, it may grow fast with good form and quality for saw logs. 
red maple is deciduous with leaves oppositely arranged on the twig as you can see in the photo. The leaves are simple in form, meaning made up of one blade, and the leaves have three lobes with shallow sinuses. Those are the indentations between the lobes. The lobes are palmate, which means the midribs radiate from one point at the base of the leaf, and you can see in the photo this leaf has three midribs that start at the base of the leaf at the petiole, and the margins are serrated or toothed. The upper surface of the leaf is green, and the underside is somewhat whitened. In Kentucky, the other maple you may confuse with red maple based on the leaf is silver maple, which also is sometimes referred to as water maple. As you can see, the silver maple leaf has five lobes with very deep sinuses as compared to the red maple. Red maple browse is considered to be toxic to horses and cattle, especially during summer and fall. Brilliant fall coloring is one of the outstanding features of red maple. In the northern forest, its bright red foliage is a striking contrast against the dark green conifers and white bark and yellow foliage of the paper birches. In Kentucky, it's just as striking against the russet oaks, golden sugar maples, and deep greens of our pines. Red maple has long been a valued ornamental tree due to its brightly red-colored spring flowers, its reddish fruit, outstanding fall color, rapid growth, and ease of an establishment. It's a nice addition to any landscape. Red maple is one of the first trees to flower in the spring, typically several weeks before the leaves emerge. This species is polygamodioecious, which means some trees are entirely male, producing no seed, some trees are entirely female, and some trees are monoecious, which means bearing both male and female flowers. The top photo shows male flowers, and the bottom photo shows female flowers. Because of the abundance and wide distribution of red maple, its early produced pollen may be important for bees and other pollen-dependent insects. Red maple is primarily wind-pollinated, but insect pollination is reported to be important as many insects, especially bees, visit the flowers. The fruit is a small paired Samara, which is a winged seed. In fact, red maple has the smallest Samaras of all native maples, only about three-fourths of an inch long. The Samaras have slightly divergent wings and hanging clusters. They are often reddish and they ripen to a light brown in late spring, many times before the leaves have even completely developed. Red maple is a prolific seed producing tree and trees as young as four years may begin to bear seed. Bumper crops are usually produced in alternate years and with a 12 inch diameter tree yielding nearly a million seeds. Seeds are wind dispersed and can germinate almost immediately. Because of early seed dispersal and almost immediate germination, red maple seedlings can become established with a three to four month advantage over most associated woody species. Several wildlife species eat or browse the foliage and twigs of red maple, including white-tailed deer, moose, elk, and snowshoe hare. It can be especially valuable to white-tailed deer during the late fall and winter. The seeds, buds, and flowers are also eaten by various wildlife species. Squirrels and chipmunks are known to store the seeds, and cavities in red maples that are in river floodplains are often well suited for cavity nesters such as the wood duck. Yellow-bellied sapsuckers, which are a type of woodpecker, are known to attack or peck holes into trees in larger woody shrubs, feeding on the bark, the sap, and the insects that are drawn to the sap. Red maple is a favorite of sap suckers. The sap suckers are attracted to previously attract trees and may return to the same tree year after year. Holes made by the sap sucker can provide points of entry for wood decaying fungi and bacteria, and the physical damage may weaken trees, making them more susceptible to secondary diseases and insects. The bark on young trees is smooth and light gray. As the tree ages and grows, the bark darkens and breaks into long, scaly plates. The tree's thin bark, especially on the younger trees, makes it very sensitive to fire. The wood of red maple resembles sugar maple, but is softer in texture and not as heavy. Red maple is considered a soft maple, and sugar maple is considered a hard maple. The sapwood of the red maple is most commonly used for lumber rather than the heartwood. Sapwood color ranges from almost white to a light golden or reddish brown, while the heartwood is a darker reddish brown. Red maple can also be seen with curly or quilted grain patterns. 
The wood is used for saw timber and pulpwood and occasionally used for veneer. The wood is also used for crates, pallets, musical instruments, and small specialty items. The sap can also be used for maple syrup, even though hard maples, such as sugar and black maple, are the principal species used for syrup production. Red maple sap has only about half the sugar content that is found in sugar maple sap. The national champion red maple is located in New Haven, Connecticut. It's 276 inches or 23 feet in circumference, 72 feet tall with a 68 foot crown spread. The Kentucky champion red maple is in Fayette County. It is 140 inches or almost 12 feet in circumference, 73 feet tall with a 72 foot crown spread. If you'd like to know more about champion trees, check out American Forest Champion Tree National Register or check out the Kentucky Division of Forestry Champion Trees. Now for a few fun facts about red maple. The common name, red maple, is referring to the red twigs, buds, flowers, and fall leaves. The scientific species name for this tree is rubrum, which is Latin for red. Native Americans used maple as an analgesic and brewed the inner bark to treat coughs. Pioneers made cinnamon brown and black dyes from a bark extract. Red maple is the state tree of Rhode Island. And red maple makes up over 12% of all trees in Kentucky, according to the Kentucky Division of Forestry. I hope you've enjoyed learning about red maple and get the opportunity to get out into your woodland, local park or neighborhood and enjoy the resplendent red maple. Thank you, Lori. We greatly appreciate that um, video on red maple today. And again, if anybody has any questions, please make sure to type them in the chat pod. And uh, Lori, if you don't mind to get back on, um, I wanted to ask you a couple of questions. Um, one being red maple is what makes maple or maples is what makes maple syrup. Um, mm -hmm. So how many trees do you actually need to make maple syrup? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure exactly how many trees you would need. <laughs> and um, I'd not being a, terribly familiar with maple syrup production. I know if Shad Baker or Jeremy might be in on this, they can probably answer this much better than me. But um, for maple syrup, what I understand, it takes about 40 gallons of sugar maple sap to make one gallon of maple syrup. So now you wouldn't get all 40 gallons probably from one tree, I'm assuming. Um, and since red maple has about half the sugar content as sugar maple, I would imagine you're going to need twice as much of that sap to boil that down to make um, a gallon of maple syrup. Um, but again, I'm just, that's just kind of doing a little bit of math there. So maybe Jeremy, who's on, he might be able to answer that better for us. And Billy, I know you know, you're somewhat familiar with some maple yeah, syrup. Yeah, so I've had a chance to work a little bit with the maple syrup and certainly don't claim any expertise. Um, but yes, what you were saying is basically right. It's about twice. Um, but one thing that we have seen, and I think Jeremy's coming on, is that we have seen some variation even within an individual tree. So some trees, whether they be red or sugar, can have varying um, sugar levels in their sap. So individuals can vary quite a bit. And in some instances, I would say that you can actually see a red maple that might have a higher sugar content than a sugar maple. Now that's not likely to be always the case, but it is in that realm. Um, kind of gets back to that answer a little bit, Laurie, it depends, right? Um, it depends right. on a number of different factors, but um, mm -hmm. I think that's a good rule of thumb is it takes about twice as much sap um, from red maple to make as much as it would from sugar maple. We did have a question about red maple wilted leaves are um, known for oh, toxicity to horses. Do they know horses, anything about okay. wildlife or deer in particular? Uh, Matt's on gonna, here, so we let can Matt, ask Matt. I, I know it is, it is a browse species for deer, but Matt can probably speak more closely, more specifically to this. So um, deer will browse upon it. They don't like it very much, though. Usually it's only consumed in um, periods when they're incredibly stressed. So, um, you know, that's, that's generally uh, February, March, and early April if it's a long winter. So at that time, I don't think the toxicity level would kick in. Um, there's usually not too many wilted leaves sitting around. Uh, other than that, it's um, not so preferred by deer. So I would, and, and I think, believe the same goes uh, for elk as well, since we're in Kentucky. Yeah, it's lower down on their, um, with their, with their favorite chart. So. <laughs> yeah. Any other wildlife, Matt, that it would affect? Uh, the Samoas are really, well, a, a fact, no, not really. Um, you know, it, the, the problem with uh, horses and cattle is sometimes they're, 
being that they're not a native species, they tend to just kind of walk around and taste things. Um, and that's usually where they get in trouble. Um, so, but yeah, no, it's incredibly important for other, you know, the squirrels and rodents that the right. seed sources are, are really, really important early, early on for them. Right. And especially since it does seed so early, that's a readily available food that those, that those um, small mammals may not have elsewhere yet. So. Correct. You know, Laurie, I was looking at some of the data related to red maple, and you did mention over 12% of all the species um, in Kentucky were red maple trees. Um, mm -hmm. I guess if we counted them all, but, it, you know, there, and it's actually the, the, there's more red maple than any other species, you know, any other individual species. And um, we're seeing a lot of proliferation of red maple really across the landscape. And you mentioned some of those reasons for sure. Um, one thing that, you know, we look at as foresters and that is um, how we harvest our trees. And a lot of times we've seen some harvesting practices that are just kind of been very selective. Um, it really almost just high grading, taking the best. And that's really not created a great light condition. So it seems like it's helped right. red maple be really successful in those kind of smaller gaps that that our oaks can't survive in. So, right. Mm -hmm. So and that's I would encourage, go ahead. Sorry. We did also have a question about sources of maple syrup in Kentucky. Sounds like we need to do a maple syrup show. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, along those lines, Renee, we are working very closely with the Kentucky Maple Syrup Association, our department is, and that's a great group. And we also have a number of county extension agents that have been heavily involved um, with the Kentucky Maple Syrup Association, including Jeremy Williams and Shad Baker, um, amongst some others there in Harlan and Lutcher County. So um, there are, I would encourage people to check out the Kentucky Maple Syrup Association. Um, they're working on their website and some other things. Um, but Jeremy, I don't know if you got some thoughts um, related to where people could source um, some Kentucky maple syrup if, you, if you're able to answer that. Billy, I think uh, if your all's website is still up from the uh, the maple, the you know, the maple mm -hmm. syrup uh, venture back in, uh, I guess it was back in mm -hmm. February. Yeah, uh, Kentucky maple up, there day. Were yeah. Several, there were several on there uh, from the maple syrup day. So that may be something that they want to check into um, if okay. their website's still up. Yeah. Yeah. And Renee, maybe we can post that that map that shows the Google map that had the locations of the host farms and stuff um, on our website or at least provide a link to it. Excellent. So there are quite a few and, and there's more than that. These were just the ones that participated last year or this year in our Kentucky Maple Day. So this was a day that we partnered with um, Jeremy and Shad and the Kentucky Maple Syrup Association to highlight uh, maple syrup production here in Kentucky. And, um, you know, again, sugar maple is really kind of the preferred because of the higher sugar content, but um, I think we're trying to use whatever we can. And red maple is certainly one of the species that they're gonna have to look at increasingly, um, you know, to provide sap for maple syrup production. So um, yeah, check out that website. And and I will say, um, like, like you'd mentioned, Renee, we do plan to have the maple syrup group on um, here at a future show and talk about maple syrup production in Kentucky. Um, and we're making plans for actually Actually, a Kentucky maple syrup school um, that will be held on November 7th. So as those details confirm up, we'll be announcing that um, here on this show as well. So stay tuned for that. Definitely. All right. Well, that concludes today's show. So um, we greatly appreciate all of you for watching and uh, joining us today. And remember that any show that we've have um, will be on from the woods today.com. You can take uh, watch any show that we've had or uh, in the past or even join live from that. Um, so we, again, we always greatly appreciate you joining us um, via zoom or Facebook live. Uh, we greatly appreciate anyone uh, that's kept, participates in our show each week and we hope to see you again uh, next week at 11. No doubt. So please join us and um, we're going to be talking about some best management practices that you can do and what you need to be thinking about um, as you're out and about and on your property. So um, again, and also like you talk said, about remember, the Ag water, ag water quality, yeah, ag water plan. quality plan as well. So, um, yeah, yeah, so we're looking forward to next week's show. So, um, yeah, thank you all for being with us and uh, please help us spread the word. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you all next week at 11 Eastern time.